Hey guys, so in the video where I introduced probability, I did mention the frequentist notion of probability and mentioned that this is not the only notion of probability and it's not without its problems. And uh, that is actually very much a topic in and of itself. So I want to talk in this video a little bit, give you an introduction to a little bit of the history of probability and, and some of the issues surrounding what probability actually means in a real world sense. Because uh, that is very much an unsettled issue, especially amongst philosophers. So uh, to start out, uh, we can say that uh, humans have for a very long time had some intuition of what philosophy means, that uh, you can certainly go back to ancient history and discover that people had an idea of uh, like chance and gambling and um, uh, what the odds are and that there is such a thing as odds. So uh, these ideas are very old, but philo uh, probability didn't start getting a rigorous mathematical treatment until DeMar's book, The Doctrines of Chance, which was published in the 1700s. Uh, I t have a tendency to think of uh, probability as being about as old as calculus in that sense, but not as well fleshed out as calculus. It wasn't, for, for a very long time, uh, probability was this uh, collection of disjoint facts where we knew, uh, like for example, a law of large numbers and a central limit theorem for certain uh, special situations, but it wasn't even really considered mathematics because uh, probably really didn't go beyond uh, certain select situations. It wasn't until Komogorov's book, he was a Soviet mathematician, uh, and he wrote in the early 20th century a book called The Foundations of the Theory of Probability that gr uh, grounded probability theory into the realm of analysis and real analysis. And this is when probability became a proper subset of mathematics. Uh, once uh, Komogorov published his book, and now he had a language that unified these disparate ideas uh, these separate ideas and uh, select examples in probability into an overarching theory. Um, uh, so uh, that said, what Komogorov did was he provided a set of mathematical axioms for probability theory that allowed us to talk about the mathematics of probability. So once you have a, a sample space, uh, a set of events of which you can talk, about which for what it's worth events them uh, so the set of events isn't all subsets of the sample space in general uh but we're gonna leave that aside that's very much a theoretical and technical issue um uh he gave us that once you have this and also uh, uh these two things and also a probability measure you have a probability triple that can then be used for mathematical analysis of of, of uh, probability and this makes probability proper mathematics, but the thing is, though, probability wants to talk about the real world, and the mathematics doesn't say anything about what probability means in a real-world sense. It's just mathematical objects, uh, and not necessarily what should I what should I be thinking about uh, what happens when I flip a coin, stuff like that. Uh, that is something else. So uh, let's start out with. Uh, some incorrect notions of probability that uh, students have. The only one that I can think of off the top of my head, because it's been a long time since I taught Math 1070 at the U, where a lot of these uh, notions uh, have to be discussed. Uh, there's this uh, desire to say that if, let, let's say that you have are going to flip a coin 10 times, uh, it's tempting to say, that uh, if the probability of getting heads is one half, then you're going to see uh, five heads in this sample. So in other words, it's going to be the frequency with which something occurs. And that is certainly not true. And all I have to do is say this. Uh, you have a coin, and it's a 50-50 coin, so it's a fair coin. Flip it once. Are you going to get heads or tails? Is the proportion of heads going to be one half when you flip the coin once? Certainly not. So... Uh, this cannot be r right. Instead, what you want to say is that uh, probability is related to some uh, long-term behavior or long-term frequency, and this is the frequentist notion of probability, which is very closely tying uh, 
our notion of probability to long run frequencies, uh, very closely tying it to the point that there are certain statements that you cannot make when this is your definition of probability because you cannot tie uh, those events or those statements to something that you can repeat. Uh, because now you don't have a notion of long run frequency because this is no longer a thing that you can do. Uh, so this is frequentism that a probability is a long run frequency. If you were to repeat an experiment very, very, very many times, in fact, ideally an infinite number of times, uh, then that is the frequency with which an event will occur. So uh, that is frequentism. That is the basis of the frequentist school of statistics, this notion of probability, uh, saying that this, these are the things that we can talk about. And um, the frequentist school of statistics is the one that's using p-values and confidence intervals. And, and often uh, it's the school of statistics that you generally see, especially in science. Ad admittedly, in data science, Bayesian statistics, which is an alternative school I'll talk about in a second, Bayesian statistics is quite popular. Uh, but I would say, uh, for the most part, most papers are using frequentist statistics. And in the class that I'm teaching, I'm teaching frequentist statistics. And in um, the the mathematics department of the University of Utah, which admittedly has at this point one statistician, <laughs> it used to be more, but it, basically there's one statistician. It's Leos Horvat, my advisor. Uh, there are probabilists there who are actually very good. Uh, they're very good probabilists. Um, so, uh, which is a different area of mathematics. So not very many statisticians there these days. Um, and Laos at uh, kind of wants to retire <laughs> too. <laughs> at which point it's like, well, now what? All right. Um, uh, so, uh, this is the more common school and this is the notion of uh, probability that's used. And this is the pro notion of probability that I am teaching. And here's the thing. This is not a perfect, uh, definition or notion of probability. And it has a few problems. Uh, one of which is what exactly is the long run? What are we talking about when we're talking about the long run? Like in a mathematical sense, it's very well defined because there's still probability theory. There's still probably mathematics. You're talking about limits and uh, you're talking about almost sure limits or all these different uh, notions of limits that are used in probability theory, in which case uh, things are working out quite fine. Uh, but uh, when you're talking about the real world, what exactly are you talking about? What what constitutes a lot? Because everything is finite, not infinite. We are living in a very finite universe. So what exactly are we talking about when we uh, talk about the long run? Especially since if you're talking about a long run frequency, like every frequency you see is finite and every sample that you see is finite. And uh, like, you, like you repeat this uh, coin flipping experiment every single time, but why not treat that entire string of, of heads and tails as your sample. There's also this issue of uh, when you're talking about relative frequency, relative to what? What is your sample space? Like when we're flipping heads and tails uh, many, many times, are we repeating the same experiment and working with only one sample space that consists of heads and tails? So it only has two elements of it. Or actually, work? are we working with the sample space that consists of so many strings a, a, a strength of such a length of heads and tails. Is that the appropriate sample space? In which case, we're only going to see one outcome from that sample space. So, so there's this relative to what? what re, a long term in terms of what uh, issue uh, when it comes to frequentism. And there's also, when we're talking about uh, long term frequencies of events in frequentism, um, we're, we're talking about limiting behavior, but here's a problem. We, we've founded probability theory in Komogorovian axiomatic probability theory in, in the Komogorovian framework. And in that framework, and in every single graduate course on probability theory, the long-term behavior of the sample proportion, which is what frequentism is talking about, that long-term behavior is not an assumption. It is something that you prove. So you don't assume that this is true. You prove that it is true. So we are taking something that we're proving in the mathematics and making it a definition, which is disconcerting. We don't like that. 
Why is it that we're taking something that, why are we basing our, our, our analysis in Kamogorovian work in, in Kamogorovian mathematics and then taking a conclusion of a theorem as our definition? That's logically not very sound. Um, now, I, I, I think one way around this might be, well, actually, when we're proving uh, this long run behavior in the Kamogorovian framework, like you're proving an equivalence between two things. So, uh, so we might drop something else. It, it might say that if we're going to adopt this frequentist uh, uh, notion, then something's redundant. Um, that one of our that we're that we're going to include the Komogorovian ax, uh, uh, axioms and then the law of large numbers, and then we end up with redundancy. And that's okay. It's okay logically to be slightly redundant because that means that you can remove something. So I think that's. So that might be one way around it, but still, it does show that there is a problem with the frequentist notion. Um, and in addition to this, there's the uh, unsavory problem of limiting the phenomena for which we can talk about probabilities, because we can be, we're basically limiting our discussion to things that can be repeated, which rules out. Uh, phenomena that we will that people still talk about in a probabilistic sense for example what's the probability that the utah jazz are going to beat the denver nuggets in tomorrow's basketball game although there is no such game because coronavirus um so uh, you want to be able to talk about that but this is something that you can't repeat that game is going to happen exactly once so there's nothing to be repeated same thing with like forecasting the weather this is one of the ways that people are often encountering probability they're going to encounter it in weather forecasts but tomorrow happens once so that's the problem this doesn't seem to match up with how frequentists think about probability theory um or uh i am a big fan of nate silver right so uh i've got his book but i bought this book after uh i read this book uh, i read it in barnes and noble over a few days i just regularly go there and a few days ago, well, actually a few weeks ago, I decided, you know what? I like this book so much, I want to own a copy of it, even though uh, I've already read it. Um, and uh, you may be familiar with his forecasts for presidential elections, and those forecasts do not fit into the frequentist framework, which is perfectly fine with him because he hates it. He hates the frequentist framework. Uh, this is actually the first book where I even heard about an alternative school of thought, Bayesianism. And and for what it's worth, I'm not necessarily I'm not saying I'm a Bayesian, um, uh, but he's a, but this is the first place where I where I heard about it, and uh, he, so, uh, this is pretty much leading into um, another alternative way to think about what probability means in a real world sense. Uh, so uh, there's this idea of personal probability, which. Like, I don't like the term personal probability. I like to think of it as maybe gambler's probability or um, uh, or the ticket notion of probability. So in this idea of probability, um, you the so the probability of an event is the price that a gambler would be willing to pay for a ticket that pays a dollar if the event happens and zero dollars in a duff if it doesn't and we're going to assume that this gambler is rational in an economic sense so they would not be willing to pay two dollars for this ticket right since they would not be making money the gambler wants to make a profit although you know they want to make a profit but they're also they may be there's probably an indifference price where uh if they're if they buy the ticket at this price they're indifferent to not buying it at all um in which case the fair price of the ticket um, according to this gambler, then becomes the probability of the event uh, happening. And this notion of probability is more permissive because now you don't have to restrict yourself to um, uh, things that can be repeated, uh, repeatable events. You can also talk about things that are one-offs. So that's going to include like who's going to win the basketball game tomorrow, whether it's going to rain tomorrow. Who's going to win the 2020 election, Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Um, you are including those types of events or those types of phenomena uh, in your probabilistic discussions. Um, 
So in, in addition to including the frequentist uh, types of events. So uh, this is a, a, an alternative notion, and it's quite nice for that reason. It's the notion of probability that's, I believe that's the notion that's being used in uh, Bayesianism. I saw this notion expanded upon in, uh, there's a book by uh, Bill Thompson called The Nature of Statistical Evidence. Uh, I've, I've uh, told my operating system to open it. Uh, it'll probably pop up in here, I'll pop up here in a second. Uh, but uh, this, that book, by the way, is also one that's um, a good reference to look at if you want to learn more about uh, in, interpretation of probabilities, what probabilities mean. Yeah, there's the book, um, and uh, um, how how and especially how statistics uh, relates to uh, probability and kind of and also I guess they're talking about what st uh, statistics means, what statistical evidence means in the real world. Uh, so I haven't read this book uh, from beginning to end, and I actually would really like to. So, oh, what did I just do? Uh, oh, oops. Oopsies. I closed the wrong window. Oh, now you're going to do that, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, all right, fine. I guess the window's decided. I don't know. This is a moody window. Uh, FF play. But anyway, uh, where was I? Where was I? Oh yeah, so uh, this this notion of probability, I believe, is the notion of probability that's preferred by the Bayesians, uh, Bayesian statistics, which is a school of statistical thought that is largely founded based on Bayes' theorem. Uh, where uh, I, I'm not going to go into Bayesianism because that's a uh, that's its own whole discussion. Um, uh, let's let's uh, stick to to the issue at hand now. Uh, before you're too tempted to become uh, to subscribe to this um, uh, gambler's notion of probability, which you know it's it's also kind of cute because it's talking about gambling. Um, uh, before you get too tempted to say, "Well, this must be it," uh, there's it has its own issues too. Uh, for starters, it's rooted essentially in economic uh, utilitarian theory. So since you're rooting it in uh, in this economic theory. Economics says that two different rational uh, economic agents are allowed to have different utility curves, which means that they can have two different prices for the same phenomenon. And that's a little disturbing. We would like for probabilities to be objective. And yet two people with two different utility curves can have different probabilities. So, hmm... Like you can have so like if you're talking about flipping a coin, two different people may have different probabilities for that coin coming up heads. That's a that's 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 a little uh, um, disturbing. Uh, or there's this issue of how exactly can you learn uh, what the probability of an event is from the price of a ticket? It's some people are a little bothered by that. Or you're so deeply tied. With this utility theory, what about an agent, an economic agent that doesn't have a utility a utility function? Here's another reference for you if you're curious about this. Uh, this is an SEP or the Stanford Encyclopedia uh, a Philosophy article on the interpretations of probability theory or interpretations of what probability is. And uh, they, they the, the author of this article brings up a Zen Buddhist monk or a, a, a real true Zen Buddhist who wants nothing they don't want anything they do not care about anything but this gambler's notion of probability requires that you care oh that's it's doing it again hey <sighs> what whatever at some point i'm probably gonna give up on the video <laughs> um okay so that's that's a problem. What if someone doesn't have a utility function? You now have to have, in addition to probabilities, a utility function. What if you don't have one? Then there is no probability? But well, it seems like there should be. There, sh there should be a probability regardless of whether you want anything or not. So uh, these are problems. And, and by the way, there are some ways around some of the issues that I'm mentioning. And there are also some further objections. This really is kind of its own issue. 
area of philosophy of uh, attempting to define what probability means and these are only some of the objections to these uh interpretations and only some of the possible defenses and there's also this these are only some of the uh, the uh, definitions that have been suggested for probability these are just my two favorites um the others are seem even more convoluted without really much benefit and don't solve the problem <laughs> so uh there's a so there's this whole this whole issue and here's kind of what i think about this i'm i'm, I'm mostly just letting you know that there is an issue um that statisticians need to think about and uh, here's another uh fun book this is called uh the lady tasting tea by david salzberg uh it's about the history of statistics and statistical thought and how statistics has uh, affected modern science a very readable book you do not need to be an expert uh, these two books are not technical um uh quite pleasant i enjoyed it so if you're interested in, in statistics history uh that's one of the books you should read um so what was i where was i going with this oh yeah he so in that book david Sal, david salzberg claims that uh he thinks that the issue of what probability means is so important that if we don't address it then statistics might be abandoned by civilization in a sense <laughs> uh, that that it's so important that if we can't really define what we're talking about that people might start abandoning statistics altogether because it's not really found in anything and i think uh uh we've got this quote on at the head of this page by uh bertrand russell probably is the most important concept in modern science especially as nobody has the slightest notion of what it means so uh, people, there are some philosophers or philosophy-oriented people who think that uh, defining probability is very important. Um, I'm not super concerned. My own, myself, maybe it's because I have devoted a great deal of my life to uh, statistics, so I'm not going to um, worry too much about an existential threat to my to to my reason for existence. I guess. Um, uh, so, like, it, it's uh, too much for me to comprehend, so I'm inherently going to defend it and say there's not really a problem. But I do think I have some sounder reasons than just pure self-interest for why I think that things are going to be okay, even though this is, in fact, a problem. I'm willing to accept that there is a problem. Um, but I'm also willing to accept that this is a problem more for philosophers, and uh, many people don't really need to worry about it. And so... Um, because here's here's what i think we don't have a philosophically rigorous definition of uh probability uh, or at least how probably what well, probably means in a real world sense and why it relates to the real world okay we don't have such a notion such a definition but it seems like for starters many physical experiments align directly with at least what the frequentist notion of probability would say should happen so it feels like there it like like nature itself supports an idea of probability right like i've got a little galton board that i may just demonstrate in a later video and you can flip the board around and it will and the beads will flow down and they will start to look a little bit like a normal distribution which is what frequent statistics says should happen like this is like this is something that probability theory the mathematical theory of probability uh under this frequentist notion of uh probability says should happen so there's really there is something real in that right um and there's like modern science is largely based on modern statistics or probabilistic statistics uh and it seems to work like just by our human experiences um and yeah you can start getting to this uh deeper philosophical discussion about what we're experiencing and how you would how you can justify science but whatever um, it seems like it works, okay? So, uh, um, so it seems like there's some, some truth to these ideas and the mathematics. Uh, quantum physics, I don't know very much about quantum physics because the, the highest level statistics class I took was a non-rigorous 1,000 level astronomy course where there was no real mathematics, Right, so I don't really know all that much about uh, about about physics, but I do know that quantum physics uh, is very probabilistic. Uh, 
and quantum physics is also one of the cornerstones of modern physics it's like it's it and uh einstein's theory of relativity those things are considered like like major areas in in, in physics and it's very probabilistic so it's um so yeah there's 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 that going for it too like do you want to throw away probability and quantum physics with it i, I no one really wants to do that uh uh, I mentioned that in, in my lecture video that set theory has a little bit, or at least at one point in time, had a problem. That philosopher that I mentioned, Bertrand Russell, who was a philosopher who argued that, like, all through history, many of the mathematicians were also the philosophers. Like, uh, um, um, uh, like for example, Descartes was both a mathematician and a philosopher. Um there, so many of these peoples were so there was a lot of intersection between the two areas which is not actually surprising because especially when i think about uh, philosophy and i'm not i wasn't a philosophy major by the way but when i think about philosophy and i listen to philosophy podcasts and read ph philosophical work it does feel like the mindset of a mathematician and the mindset of a philosopher there's a lot in common between those two um uh and uh, Bertrand Russell, like you can imagine, mathematics was uh, starting, like the mathematicians and the philosophers were starting to pull apart and starting to not be the same people. And Bertrand Russell said they really should be. And the philosophers, and he was like an uh, early 20th century philosopher. He was saying philosophers should pay a great deal of attention to what the mathematicians are doing and what the mathematicians are saying. Um, uh, Bertrand Russell noted that the notion in set theory that a set is a collection of objects this is problematic and he proved by constructing using this idea of sets sets that are impossible sets that cannot possibly exist because the sets themselves are logical contradictions so set theory had this issue and the thing is though i tell students in my probability class sets are collections of objects and I don't bother with the more rigorous axiomatic set theory uh, that that set that professional set theorists are using. And I don't know really if many people, aside from professional set theorists, are too concerned with the ZFC axioms and stuff. Um, like thinking in a practical sense of sets as uh, collections of objects will get you through 99% of your life as a mathematician or as a probabilist. Um, it's an imp inappropriate definition for what a set is, and yet it works very well. It will get you through it most of, most of the way, and even then, the ZFC axioms are just going to take this notion of sets as collection of objects and make it more rigorous, right? So they'll just fix the problems uh, that emerged, and then you get something that still allows for that notion of, um, of a set theory and what sets are. And, and, uh, and while well, at the same time, you're not, while well, at the same time, disallowing, uh, ridiculous, impossible sets, like the set of all sets. That's one of, uh, Russell sets or sets that are not subsets of themselves. That's another impossible set. Um, so, um, set theory kind of went through this issue, uh, this period too, where, there, what, where you have an idea of what a set is, but it's not rigorous, and that, and it, and it has problems, and yet, it's still acceptable. It's still, it still works, and there is a way in which it's still real. It's just that the definition hasn't quite caught up to it, and even then, for most people, they don't really care. Um, the 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 naive notion of what a set is will get you through ninety nine percent of your life. And I feel like the same may be true for probability. I, I'm, I suspect that the reason why we don't have a more rigorous definition of probability is because of limitations of language, that our language itself uh, is limited and maybe just our, our um, symbolic imagination is limited. Um, uh, and uh, you could pro probably come up with something more rigorous. It seems like nature has a rigorous idea of what probability is. Um, and uh and uh, but 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 we'll be fine uh uh regardless that that this is more just a technical issue that's something that philosophers care care about rather than a real problem um uh so 
and and like at, a lot of those definitions of probability that have been discredited still are capturing an essential attribute of what probability is. So there's um like I feel like the frequentist notion of probability is certainly the 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 uh, easiest to defend and it's the simplest notion of probability and certainly the one that's the most true. Um and the uh, gambling notion of probability is also pretty good too. Um uh, that all of these ideas of probability are capturing some essential characteristic of something that is essentially real and true. So, um, so I think that so my own thought is that there isn't most of, there isn't really that much of a problem, but this is something that people um, this is still an issue and something to be aware of, um, especially when you're thinking about what's the difference between Bayesian statistics and frequentist statistics. So, and, and, so yeah, there is some real effect from this, um, but I don't necessarily object so much to Bayesianism or have, I mean, I don't know if I really object to Bayesianism. I'm just, it's not my default mode. And uh, also it might be because I'm not a trained Bayesian and I know much more about, prob uh, about frequentist statistics. So I'm somewhat uh, biased in favor of what will make me money. So, which is what I know, um, but uh, but uh, I I think but generally when I'm thinking about problems with a Bayesian analysis, it's not because it's almost never because of their uh, definition of probability. All right, I I got that off my chest. It's to me it's somewhat of a fun discussion, but I also am a, a little inclined to say what Nate Silver says when he talks about this issue, which is like it's. It's kind of boring <laughs> after like talking about it too much uh, leads us to talking about something that doesn't really matter um, and, and that we shouldn't really care all that much too terribly much about. So uh, that's it for this little video, this little aside and uh, uh, have a good day.